Chapter 41 Outside Castel Gondolfo, an updraft of mountain air gushed over the top of the cliff and across the high bluff, sending a chill through Bishop Eringarosa as he stepped from the fiat. I should have worn more than this cassock, he thought, fighting the reflex to shiver. The last thing he needed to appear tonight was weak or fearful. The castle was dark save the windows at the very top of the building, which glowed ominously. The library, Eringarosa thought. They are awake and waiting. He ducked his head against the wind and continued on without so much as a glance toward the observatory domes. The priest who greeted him at the door looked sleepy. He was the same priest who had greeted Eringarosa five months ago, albeit tonight he did so with much less hospitality. We were worried about you, Bishop, the priest said, checking his watch and looking more perturbed than worried. My apologies. Airlines are so unreliable these days. The priest mumbled something inaudible and then said, They are waiting upstairs. I will escort you up. The library was a vast square room with dark wood from floor to ceiling. On all sides, towering bookcases burdened with volumes. The floor was amber marble with black basalt trim, a handsome reminder that this building had once been a palace. Welcome, Bishop. A man's voice said from across the room. Eringarosa tried to see who had spoken, but the lights were ridiculously low, much lower than they had been on his first visit, when everything was ablaze. The night of stark awakening. Tonight, these men sat in the shadows, as if they were somehow ashamed of what was about to transpire. Eringarosa entered slowly, regally even. He could see the shapes of three men at a long table on the far side of the room. The silhouette of the man in the middle was immediately recognizable, the obese secretary at Vaticana, overlord of all legal matters within Vatican City. The other two were high-ranking Italian cardinals. Eringarosa crossed the library toward them. My humble apologies for the hour. We're on different time zones. You must be tired. Not at all, the secretariat said, his hands folded on his enormous belly. We are grateful you have come so far. The least we can do is be awake to meet you. Can we offer you some coffee or refreshments? I'd prefer we don't pretend this is a social visit. I have another plane to catch. Shall we get to business? Of course, the secretariat said. You have acted more quickly than we imagined. Have I? You still have a month. You made your concerns known five months ago. Eringarosa said. Why should I wait? Indeed. We are very pleased with your expediency. Eringarosa's eyes traveled the length of the long table to a large black briefcase. Is that what I requested? It is. The secretariat sounded uneasy. Although, I must admit, we are concerned with the request. It seems quite dangerous, one of the cardinals finished. Are you certain we cannot wire it to you somewhere? The sum is exorbitant. Freedom is expensive. I have no concerns for my own safety. God is with me. The men actually looked doubtful. The funds are exactly as I requested. The secretariat nodded. Large denomination bearer bonds drawn on the Vatican Bank. Negotiable as cash anywhere in the world. Eringarosa walked to the end of the table and opened the briefcase. Inside were two thick stacks of bonds, each embossed with the Vatican seal and the title Portator, making the bones redeemable to whoever was holding them. The secretariat looked tense. I must say, Bishop, all of us would feel less apprehensive if these funds were in cash. I could not lift that much cash, Eringarosa thought, closing the case. Bonds are negotiable as cash. You said so yourself. The cardinals exchanged uneasy looks, and finally one said, Yes, but these bonds are traceable directly to the Vatican Bank. Eringarosa smiled inwardly. That was precisely the reason the teacher suggested Eringarosa get the money in Vatican Bank bonds. It served as insurance. We are all in this together now. This is a perfectly legal transaction. Eringarosa defended. Opus is a personal prelature of Vatican City, and His Holiness can disperse monies however he sees fit. 
No law has been broken here. True, and yet. The secretariat leaned forward and his chair creaked under the burden. We have no knowledge of what you intend to do with these funds, and if it is in any way illegal. Considering what you are asking of me, Eringer Rosa countered, what I do with this money is not your concern. There was a long silence. They know I'm right, Eringer Rosa thought. Now, I imagine you have something for me to sign? They all jumped, eagerly pushing the paper toward him, as if they wished he would simply leave. Eringer Rosa eyed the sheet before him. It bore the papal seal. This is identical to the copy you sent me? Exactly. Eringer Rosa was surprised how little emotion he felt as he signed the document. The three men present, however, seemed to sigh in relief. Thank you, Bishop, the secretariat said. Your service to the church will never be forgotten. Eringer Rosa picked up the briefcase sensing promise and authority in its weight. The four men looked at one another for a moment as if there were something more to say, but apparently there was not. Eringer Rosa turned and headed for the door. Bishop? One of the cardinals called out as Eringer Rosa reached the threshold. Eringer Rosa paused, turning. Yes? Where will you go from here? Eringer Rosa sensed the query was more spiritual than geographical and yet he had no intention of discussing morality at this hour. Paris, he said, and walked out the door. Chapter 42 The Depository Bank of Zurich was a 24-hour Geldschrank bank offering the full modern array of anonymous services in the tradition of the Swiss numbered account. Maintaining offices in Zurich, Kuala Lumpur, New York, and Paris, the bank had expanded its services in recent years to offer anonymous computer source code escrow services and faceless digitized backup. The bread and butter of its operation was by far its oldest and simplest offering, the Anonym Logger, Blind Drop Services, otherwise known as anonymous safe deposit boxes. Clients wishing to store anything from stock certificates to valuable paintings could deposit their belongings anonymously through a series of high-tech veils of privacy, withdrawing items at any time, also in total anonymity. As Sophie pulled the taxi to a stop in front of their destination, Langdon gazed out at the building's uncompromising architecture and sensed the Depository Bank of Zurich was a firm with little sense of humor. The building was a windowless rectangle that seemed to be forged entirely of dull steel. Resembling an enormous metal brick, the edifice sat back from the road with a 15-foot-tall, neon, equilateral cross glowing over its facade. Switzerland's reputation for secrecy in banking had become one of the country's most lucrative exports. Facilities like this had become controversial in the art community because they provided a perfect place for art thieves to hide stolen goods, for years if necessary, until the heat was off because deposits were protected from police inspection by privacy laws and were attached to numbered accounts rather than people's names, thieves could rest easily knowing their stolen goods were safe and could never be traced to them. Sophie stopped the taxi at an imposing gate that blocked the bank's driveway, a cement-lined ramp that descended beneath the building. A video camera overhead was aimed directly at them and Langdon had the feeling that this camera, unlike those at the Louvre, was authentic. Sophie rolled down the window and surveyed the electronic podium on the driver's side. An LCD screen provided directions in seven languages. Topping the list was English. Insert key. Sophie took the gold laser pocked key from her pocket and turned her attention back to the podium. Below the screen was a triangular hole. Something tells me it will fit, Langdon said. Sophie aligned the key's triangular shaft with the hole and inserted it, sliding it in until the entire shaft had disappeared. This key apparently required no turning. Instantly, the gate began to swing open. Sophie took her foot off the brake and coasted down to a second gate and podium. Behind her, the first gate closed, trapping them like a ship in a lock. Langdon disliked the constricted sensation. Let's hope this second gate works too. This second podium bore familiar directions. Insert key. 
when Sophie inserted the key, the second gate immediately opened. Moments later they were winding down the ramp into the belly of the structure. The private garage was small and dim, with spaces for about a dozen cars. At the far end, Langdon spied the building's main entrance. A red carpet stretched across the cement floor, welcoming visitors to a huge door that appeared to be forged of solid metal. Talk about mixed messages, Langdon thought. Welcome and keep out. Sophie pulled the taxi into a parking space near the entrance and killed the engine. You better leave the gun here. With pleasure, Langdon thought, sliding the pistol under the seat. Sophie and Langdon got out and walked up the red carpet toward the slab of steel. The door had no handle, but on the wall beside it was another triangular keyhole. No directions were posted this time. Keeps out the slow learners, Langdon said. Sophie laughed, looking nervous. Here we go. She stuck the key in the hole, and the door swung. Inward with a low hum. Exchanging glances, Sophie and Langdon entered. The door shut with a thud behind them. The foyer of the Depository Bank of Zurich employed as imposing a decor as any Langdon had ever seen. Where most banks were content with the usual polished marble and granite, this one had opted for wall-to-wall -wall metal and rivets. Who's their decorator? Langdon wondered. Allied Steel? Sophie looked equally intimidated as her eyes scanned the lobby. The grey metal was everywhere, the floor, walls, counters, doors, even the lobby chairs appeared to be fashioned of molded iron. Nonetheless, the effect was impressive. The message was clear, you're walking into a vault. A large man behind the counter glanced up as they entered. He turned off the small television he was watching and greeted them with a pleasant smile. Despite his enormous muscles and visible sidearm, his diction chimed with the polished courtesy of a Swiss bellhop. Bon Sawyer, he said. How may I help you? The dual language greeting was the newest hospitality trick of the European host. It presumed nothing and opened the door for the guest to reply in whichever language was more comfortable. Sophie replied with neither. She simply laid the gold key on the counter in front of the man. The man glanced down and immediately stood straighter. Of course. Your elevator is at the end of the hall. I will alert someone that you are on your way. Sophie nodded and took her key back. Which floor? The man gave her an odd look. Your key instructs the elevator which floor? She smiled. Ah, yes. The guard watched as the two newcomers made their way to the elevators, inserted their key, boarded the lift, and disappeared. As soon as the door had closed, he grabbed the phone. He was not calling to alert anyone of their arrival, there was no need for that. A vault greeter already had been alerted automatically when the client's key was inserted outside in the entry gate. Instead, the guard was calling the bank's night manager. As the line rang, the guard switched the television back on and stared at it. The news story he had been watching was just ending. It didn't matter. He got another look at the two faces on the television. The manager answered. We? We have a situation down here. What's happening? The manager demanded. The French police are tracking two fugitives tonight. So? Both of them just walked into our bank. The manager cursed quietly. Okay. I'll contact Monsieur Vernet immediately. The guard then hung up and placed a second call. This one to Interpol. Langdon was surprised to feel the elevator dropping rather than climbing. He had no idea how many floors they had descended beneath the depository bank of Zurich before the door finally opened. He didn't care. He was happy to be out of the elevator. Displaying impressive alacrity, a host was already standing there to greet them. He was elderly and pleasant, wearing a neatly pressed flannel suit that made him look oddly out of place, an old world banker in a high tech world. Bon Sawyer, the man said. Good evening. Would you be so kind as to follow me, Silvu Plate? Without waiting for a response, he spun on his heel and strode briskly down a narrow metal corridor. Langdon walked with Sophie down a series of corridors, 
past several large rooms filled with blinking mainframe computers. Voicey, their host said, arriving at a steel door and opening it for them. Here you are. Langdon and Sophie stepped into another world. The small room before them looked like a lavish sitting room at a fine hotel. Gone were the metal and rivets, replaced with oriental carpets, dark oak furniture, and cushioned chairs. On the broad desk in the middle of the room, two crystal glasses sat beside an opened bottle of barrier, its bubbles still fizzing. A pewter pot of coffee steamed beside it. Clockwork, Langdon thought. Leave it to the Swiss. The man gave a perceptive smile. I sense this is your first visit to us? Sophie hesitated and then nodded. Understood. Keys are often passed on as inheritance, and our first-time users are invariably uncertain of the protocol. He motioned to the table of drinks. This room is yours as long as you care to use it. You say keys are sometimes inherited? Sophie asked. Indeed. Your key is like a Swiss numbered account, which are often willed through generations. On our gold accounts, the shortest safety deposit box lease is 50 years. Paid in advance. So we see plenty of family turnover. Langdon stared. Did you say 50 years? At a minimum, their host replied. Of course, you can purchase much longer leases, but barring further arrangements, if there is no activity on an account for 50 years, the contents of that safe deposit box are automatically destroyed. Shall I run through the process of accessing your box? Sophie nodded. Please. Their host swept an arm across the luxurious salon. This is your private viewing room. Once I leave the room, you may spend all the time you need in here to review and modify the contents of your safe deposit box, which arrives. Over here. He walked them to the far wall where a wide conveyor belt entered the room in a graceful curve vaguely resembling a baggage claim carousel. You insert your key in that slot there. The man pointed to a large electronic podium facing the conveyor belt. The podium had a familiar triangular hole. Once the computer confirms the markings on your key, you enter your account number, and your safe deposit box will be retrieved robotically from the vault below for your inspection. When you are finished with your box, you place it back on the conveyor belt. Insert your key again, and the process is reversed. Because everything is automated, your privacy is guaranteed, even from the staff of this bank. If you need anything at all, simply press the call button on the table in the center of the room. Sophie was about to ask a question when a telephone rang. The man looked puzzled and embarrassed. Excuse me, please. He walked over to the phone which was sitting on the table beside the coffee and barrier. We? He answered. His brow furrowed as he listened to the caller. We. We. Decord. He hung up, and gave them. An uneasy smile. I'm sorry, I must leave you now. Make yourselves at home. He moved quickly toward the door. Excuse me, Sophie called. Could you clarify something before you go? You mentioned that we enter an account number? The man paused at the door, looking pale. But of course. Like most Swiss banks, our safe deposit boxes are attached to a number, not a name. You have a key and a personal account number known only to you. Your key is only half of your identification. Your personal account number is the other half. Otherwise, if you lost your key, anyone could use it. Sophie hesitated. And if my benefactor gave me no account number? The banker's heart pounded. Then you obviously have no business here. He gave them a calm smile. I will ask someone to help you. He will be in shortly. Leaving, the banker closed the door behind him and twisted a heavy lock, sealing them inside. Across town, Collett was standing in the Gare du Nord train terminal when his phone rang. It was Fock. Interpol got a tip, he said. Forget the train. Langdon and Davu just walked into the Paris branch of the Depository Bank of Zurich. I want your men over there right away. Any leads yet on what Sonier was trying to tell Agent Davu and Robert Langdon? Fox's tone was cold. If you arrest them, 
Lieutenant Collett, then I can ask them personally. Collett took the hint. 24 Rue Haxo. Right away, Captain. He hung up and radioed his men. Chapter 43 André Vernet, president of the Paris branch of the Depository Bank of Zurich, lived in a lavish flat above the bank. Despite his plush accommodations, he had always dreamed of owning a riverside apartment on Mont saint louis where he could rub shoulders with the true connoscenti, rather than here, where he simply met the filthy rich. When I retire, Vernet told himself, I will fill my cellar with rare Bordeaux, adorn my salon with a Fragonard and perhaps a voucher, and spend my days hunting for antique furniture and rare books in the courtier Latin. Tonight, Vernet had been awake only six and a half minutes. Even so, as he hurried through the bank's underground corridor, he looked as if his personal tailor and hairdresser had polished him to a fine sheen. Impeccably dressed in a silk suit, Vernet sprayed some breath spray in his mouth and tightened his tie as he walked. No stranger to being awoken to attend to his international clients arriving from different time zones, Vernet modeled his sleep habits after the Maasai warriors, the African tribe famous for their ability to rise from the deepest sleep to a state of total battle readiness in a matter of seconds. Battle ready, Vernet thought, fearing the comparison might be uncharacteristically apt tonight. The arrival of a gold key client always required an extra flurry of attention, but the arrival of a gold key client who was wanted by the judicial police would be an extremely delicate matter. The bank had enough battles with law enforcement over the privacy rights of their clients without proof that some of them were criminals. Five minutes, Vernet told himself. I need these people out of my bank before the police arrive. If he moved quickly, this impending disaster could be deftly sidestepped. Vernet could tell the police that the fugitives in question had indeed walked into his bank as reported, but because they were not clients and had no account number, they were turned away. He wished the damned watchman had not called Interpol. Discretion was apparently not part of the vocabulary of a 15 euro per hour watchman. Stopping at the doorway, he took a deep breath and loosened his muscles. Then, forcing a balmy smile, he unlocked the door and swirled into the room like a warm breeze. Good evening, he said, his eyes finding his clients. I am Andre Vernet. How can I be of serve? The rest of the sentence lodged somewhere beneath his Adam's apple. The woman before him was as unexpected a visitor as Vernet had ever had. I'm sorry, do we know each other? Sophie asked. She did not recognize the banker but he for a moment looked as if he'd seen a ghost. No, the bank president fumbled. I don't believe so. Our services are anonymous. He exhaled and forced a calm smile. My assistant tells me you have a gold key but no account number? Might I ask how you came by this key? My grandfather gave it to me, Sophie replied, watching the man closely. His uneasiness seemed more evident now. Really? Your grandfather gave you the key but failed to give you the account number? I don't think he had time, Sophie said. He was murdered tonight. Her words sent the man staggering backward. Jacques Saunier is dead? He demanded, his eyes filling with horror. But. How? Now it was Sophie who reeled, numb with shock. You knew my grandfather? Banker Andre Vernet looked equally astounded steadying himself by leaning on an end table. Jacques and I were dear friends. When did this happen? Earlier this evening. Inside the Louvre. Vernet walked to a deep leather chair and sank into it. I need to ask you both a very important question. He glanced up at Langdon and then back to Sophie. Did either of you have anything to do with his death? No. Sophie declared. Absolutely not. Vernet's face was grim, and he paused, pondering. Your pictures are being circulated by Interpol. This is how I recognized you. You're wanted for a murder. Sophie slumped. Fock ran an Interpol broadcast already? It seemed the captain was more motivated than Sophie had anticipated. She quickly told Vernet who Langdon was and what had happened inside the Louvre tonight. Vernet looked amazed. And as your grandfather was dying, 
he left you a message telling you to find Mr. Langdon? Yes. And this key? Sophie laid the gold key on the coffee table in front of Vernet, placing the priory seal face down. Vernet glanced at the key but made no move to touch it. He left you only this key? Nothing else? No slip of paper? Sophie knew she had been in a hurry inside the Louvre, but she was certain she had seen nothing else behind Madonna of the Rocks. No. Just the key. Vernet gave a helpless sigh. I'm afraid every key is electronically paired with a 10-digit account number that functions as a password. Without that number, your key is worthless. 10 digits. Sophie reluctantly calculated the cryptographic odds. Over 10 billion possible choices. Even if she could bring in DCPJ's most powerful parallel processing computers, she still would need weeks to break the code. Certainly, Monsieur. Considering the circumstances, you can help us. I'm sorry. I truly can do nothing. Clients select their own account numbers via a secure terminal, meaning account numbers are known only to the client and computer. This is one way we ensure anonymity. And the safety of our employees. Sophie understood. Convenience stores did the same thing. Employees do not have keys to the safe. This bank obviously did not want to risk someone stealing a key and then holding an employee hostage for the account number. Sophie sat down beside Langdon, glanced down at the key and then up at Vernet. Do you have any idea what my grandfather is storing in your bank? None whatsoever. That is the definition of a Geldsrink bank. Monsieur Vernet, she pressed, our time tonight is short. I am going to be very direct if I may. She reached out to the gold key and flipped it over, watching the man's eyes as she revealed the Priory of Science Seal. Does the symbol on this key mean anything to you? Vernet glanced down at the fleur de lis seal and made no reaction. No, but many of our clients emboss corporate logos or initials onto their keys. Sophie sighed, still watching him carefully. This seal is the symbol of a secret society known as the Priory of Cyan. Vernet again showed no reaction. I know nothing of this. Your grandfather was a friend, but we spoke mostly of business. The man adjusted his tie, looking nervous now. Monsieur Vernet, Sophie pressed, her tone firm. My grandfather called me tonight and told me he and I were in grave danger. He said he had to give me something. He gave me a key to your bank. Now he is dead. Anything you can tell us would be helpful. Vernet broke a sweat. We need to get out of the building. I'm afraid the police will arrive shortly. My watchman felt obliged to call Interpol. Sophie had feared as much. She took one last shot. My grandfather said he needed to tell me the truth about my family. Does that mean anything to you? Mademoiselle, your family died in a car accident when you were young? I'm sorry. I know your grandfather loved you very much. He mentioned to me several times how much it pained him that you two had fallen out of touch. Sophie was uncertain how to respond. Langdon asked, do the contents of this account have anything to do with the Sangreal? Vernet gave him an odd look. I have no idea what that is. Just then, Vernet's cell phone rang, and he snatched it off his belt. We? Oui? He listened a moment his expression one of surprise and growing concern. La police? See rapidement? He cursed, gave some quick directions in French, and said he would be up to the lobby in a minute. Hanging up the phone, he turned back to Sophie. The police have responded far more quickly than usual. They are arriving as we speak. Sophie had no intention of leaving empty-handed. Tell them we came and went already. If they want to search the bank. Demand a search warrant. That will take them time. Listen, Vernet said, Jacques was a friend, and my bank does not need this kind of press, so for those two reasons, I have no intention of allowing this arrest to be made on my premises. Give me a minute and I will see what I can do to help you leave the bank undetected. Beyond that, I cannot get involved. He stood up and hurried for the door. Stay here. I'll make arrangements and be right back. But the safe deposit box, 
Sophie declared. We can't just leave. There's nothing I can do, Vernet said, hurrying out the door. I'm sorry. Sophie stared after him a moment, wondering if maybe the account number was buried in one of the countless letters and packages her grandfather had sent her over the years and which she had left unopened. Langdon stood suddenly, and Sophie sensed an unexpected glimmer of contentment in his eyes. Robert? You're smiling. Your grandfather was a genius. I'm sorry? Ten digits? Sophie had no idea what he was talking about. The account number, he said, a familiar lopsided grin now craning his face. I'm pretty sure he left it for us after all. Where? Langdon produced the print out of the crime scene photo and spread it out on the coffee table. Sophie needed only to read the first line to know Langdon was correct. 13321111850, Draconian Devil. Oh, lame saint. P.S. Find Robert Langdon. Chapter 44. Ten digits, Sophie said, her cryptologic senses tingling as she studied the printout. 13321111850. Grandpa wrote his account number on the Louvre floor. When Sophie had first seen the scrambled Fibonacci sequence on the parquet, she had assumed its sole purpose was to encourage DCPJ to call in their cryptographers and get Sophie involved. Later, she realized the numbers were also a clue as to how to decipher the other lines, a sequence out of order. An Americanogram. Now, utterly amazed, she saw the numbers had a more important meaning still. They were almost certainly the final key to opening her grandfather's mysterious safe deposit box. He was the master of double entendres, Sophie said, turning to Langdon. He loved anything with multiple layers of meaning. Codes within codes. Langdon was already moving toward the electronic podium near the conveyor belt. Sophie grabbed the computer printout and followed. The podium had a keypad similar to that of a bank ATM terminal. The screen displayed the bank's cruciform logo. Beside the keypad was a triangular hole. Sophie wasted no time inserting the shaft of her key into the hole. The screen refreshed instantly. Account number, underscore 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 underscore. The cursor blinked. Waiting. Ten digits. Sophie read the numbers off the printout and Langdon typed them in. Account number, 1,332,211,185. When he had typed the last digit, the screen refreshed again. A message in several languages appeared. English was on top. Caution. Before you strike the Enter key, please check the accuracy of your account number. For your own security. If the computer does not recognize your account number, this system will automatically shut down. Function Terminer, Sophie said, frowning. Looks like we only get one try. Standard ATM machines allowed users three attempts to type a PIN before confiscating their bank card. This was obviously no ordinary cash machine. The number looks right, Langdon confirmed, carefully checking what they had typed and comparing it to the printout. He motioned to the Enter key. Fire away. Sophie extended her index finger toward the keypad, but hesitated, an odd thought now hitting her. Go ahead, Langdon urged. Vernet will be back soon. No. She pulled her hand away. This isn't the right account number. Of course it is. Ten digits. What else would it be? It's too random. Too random? Langdon could not have disagreed more. Every bank advised its customers to choose pins at random so nobody could guess them. Certainly clients here would be advised to choose their account numbers at random. Sophie deleted everything she had just typed in and looked up at Langdon, her gaze self-assured. It's far too coincidental that this supposedly random account number could be rearranged to form the Fibonacci sequence. Langdon realized she had a point. Earlier, Sophie had rearranged this account number into the Fibonacci sequence. What were the odds of being able to do that? Sophie was at the keypad again, entering a different number, 
as if from memory. Moreover, with my grandfather's love of symbolism and codes, it seems to follow that he would have chosen an account number that had meaning to him, something he could easily remember. She finished typing the entry and gave a sly smile. Something that appeared random. But was not. Langdon looked at the screen. Account number, 1,123,581,321. It took him an instant, but when Langdon spotted it, he knew she was right. The Fibonacci sequence. 1123581321. When the Fibonacci sequence was melded into a single 10-digit number, it became virtually unrecognizable. Easy to remember, and yet seemingly random. A brilliant 10-digit code that Saunier would never forget. Furthermore, it perfectly explained why the scrambled numbers on the Louvre floor could be rearranged to form the famous progression. Sophie reached down and pressed the Enter key. Nothing happened. At least nothing they could detect. At that moment, beneath them, in the bank's cavernous subterranean vault, a robotic claw sprang to life. Sliding on a double-access transport system attached to the ceiling, the claw headed off in search of the proper coordinates. On the cement floor below, hundreds of identical plastic crates lay aligned on an enormous grid. Like rows of small coffins in an underground crypt. Wearing to a stop over the correct spot on the floor, the claw dropped down an electric eye confirming the barcode on the box. Then, with computer precision, the claw grasped the heavy handle and hoisted the crate vertically. New gears engaged, and the claw transported the box to the far side of the vault, coming to a stop over a stationary conveyor belt. Gently now, the retrieval arm set down the crate and retracted. Once the arm was clear, the conveyor belt whirred to life. Upstairs. Sophie and Langdon exhaled in relief to see the conveyor belt move. Standing beside the belt, they felt like weary travelers at baggage claim awaiting a mysterious piece of luggage whose contents were unknown. The conveyor belt entered the room on their right through a narrow slit beneath a retractable door. The metal door slid up, and a huge plastic box appeared, emerging from the depths on the inclined conveyor belt. The box was black, heavy molded plastic and far larger than she imagined. It looked like an air freight pet transport crate without any air holes. The box coasted to a stop directly in front of them. Langdon and Sophie stood there, silent, staring at the mysterious container. Like everything else about this bank, this crate was industrial, metal clasps, a barcode sticker on top, and molded heavy-duty handle. Sophie thought it looked like a giant toolbox. Wasting no time, Sophie unhooked the two buckles facing her. Then she glanced over at Langdon. Together, they raised the heavy lid and let it fall back. Stepping forward, they peered down into the crate. At first glance, Sophie thought the crate was empty. Then she saw something. Sitting at the bottom of the crate. A lone item. The polished wooden box was about the size of a shoebox and had ornate hinges. The wood was a lustrous deep purple with a strong grain. Rosewood, Sophie realized. Her grandfather's favorite. The lid bore a beautiful inlaid design of a rose. She and Langdon exchanged puzzled looks. Sophie leaned in and grabbed the box, lifting it out. My God, it's heavy. She carried it gingerly to a large receiving table and set it down. Langdon stood beside her both of them staring at the small treasure chest her grandfather apparently had sent them to retrieve. Langdon stared in wonderment at the lid's hand-carved inlay, a five-petal rose. He had seen this type of rose many times. The five-petal rose, he whispered, is a priory symbol for the Holy Grail. Sophie turned and looked at him. Langdon could see what she was thinking, and he was thinking it too. The dimensions of the box the apparent weight of its contents, and a priory symbol for the grail all seemed to imply one unfathomable conclusion. The cup of Christ is in this wooden box. Langdon again told himself it was impossible. It's a perfect size, Sophie whispered, to hold. A chalice. It can't be a chalice. 
Sophie pulled the box toward her across the table, preparing to open it. As she moved it, though, something unexpected happened. The box let out an odd gurgling sound. Langdon did a double take. There's liquid inside? Sophie looked equally confused. Did you just hear? Langdon nodded, lost. Liquid. Reaching forward, Sophie slowly unhooked the clasp and raised the lid. The object inside was unlike anything Langdon had ever seen. One thing was immediately clear to both of them, however. This was definitely not the cup of Christ. Chapter 45 The police are blocking the street, Andre Vernet said, walking into the waiting room. Getting you out will be difficult. As he closed the door behind him, Vernet saw the heavy-duty plastic case on the conveyor belt and halted in his tracks. My God! They accessed Saunier's account? Sophie and Langdon were at the table, huddling over what looked to be a large wooden jewelry box. Sophie immediately closed the lid and looked up. We had the account number after all, she said. Vernet was speechless. This changed everything. He respectfully diverted his eyes from the box and tried to figure out his next move. I have to get them out of the bank. But with the police already having set up a roadblock, Vernet could imagine only one way to do that. Mademoiselle Davou, if I can get you safely out of the bank, will you be taking the item with you or returning it to the vault before you leave? Sophie glanced at Langdon and then back to Vernet. We need to take it. Vernet nodded. Very well. Then whatever the item is, I suggest you wrap it in your jacket as we move through the hallways. I would prefer nobody else see it. As Langdon shed his jacket, Vernet hurried over to the conveyor belt, closed the now empty crate, and typed a series of simple commands. The conveyor belt began moving again, carrying the plastic container back down to the vault. Pulling the gold key from the podium, he handed it to Sophie. This way please. Hurry. When they reached the rear loading dock, Vernet could see the flash of police lights filtering through the underground garage. He frowned. They were probably blocking the ramp. Am I really going to try to pull this off? He was sweating now. Vernet motioned to one of the bank's small armored trucks. Transport Sora was another service offered by the Depository Bank of Zurich. Get in the cargo hold, he said heaving open the massive rear door and motioning to the glistening steel compartment. I'll be right back. As Sophie and Langdon climbed in, Vernet hurried across the loading dock to the dock overseer's office, let himself in, collected the keys for the truck, and found a driver's uniform jacket and cap. Shedding his own suit coat and tie, he began to put on the driver's jacket. Reconsidering, he donned a shoulder holster beneath the uniform. On his way out, he grabbed a driver's pistol from the rack, put in a clip, and stuffed it in the holster, buttoning his uniform over it. Returning to the truck, Vernet pulled the driver's cap down low and peered in at Sophie and Langdon, who were standing inside the empty steel box. You'll want this on, Vernet said, reaching inside and flicking a wall switch to illuminate the lone courtesy bulb on the hold ceiling. And you'd better sit down. Not a sound on our way out the gate. Sophie and Langdon sat down on the metal floor. Langdon cradled the treasure wadded in his tweed jacket. Swinging the heavy doors closed, Vernet locked them inside. Then he got in behind the wheel and revved the engine. As the armored truck lumbered toward the top of the ramp, Vernet could feel the sweat already collecting beneath his driver's cap. He could see there were far more police lights in front than he had imagined. As the truck powered up the ramp, the interior gate swung inward to let him pass. Vernet advanced and waited while the gate behind him closed before pulling forward and tripping. The next sensor. The second gate opened, and the exit beckoned. Except for the police car blocking the top of the ramp. Vernet dabbed his brow and pulled forward. A lanky officer stepped out and waved him to a stop a few meters from the roadblock. Four patrol cars were parked out front. Vernet stopped. Pulling his driver's cap down farther, he affected as rough a facade as his cultured upbringing would allow. Not budging from behind the wheel, 
He opened the door and gazed down at the agent, whose face was stern and sallow. Quist's key say passe? Vernet asked, his tone rough. Jesus is Jerome Collett, the agent said. Lieutenant Police Judiciaire. He motioned to the truck's cargo hold. Quist's quilly a la de don? Hell if I know, Vernet replied in crude French. I'm only a driver. Collett looked unimpressed. We're looking for two criminals. Vernet laughed. Then you came to the right spot. Some of these bastards I drive for have so much money they must be criminals. The agent held up a passport picture of Robert Langdon. Was this man in your bank tonight? Vernet shrugged. No clue. I'm a doc rat. They don't let us anywhere near the clients. You need to go in and ask the front desk. Your bank is demanding a search warrant before we can enter. Vernet put on a disgusted look. Administrators. Don't get me started. Open your truck, please. Call it motioned toward the cargo hold. Vernet stared at the agent and forced an obnoxious laugh. Open the truck? You think I have keys? You think they trust us? You should see the crap wages I get paid. The agent's head tilted to one side, his skepticism evident. You're telling me you don't have keys to your own truck? Vernet shook his head. Not the cargo area. Ignition only. These trucks get sealed by overseers on. The loading dock. Then the truck sits in dock while someone drives the cargo keys to the drop-off. Once we get the call that the cargo keys are with the recipient, then I get the okay to drive. Not a second before. I never know what the hell I'm lugging. When was this truck sealed? Must have been hours ago. I'm driving all the way up to St. Thuriel tonight. Cargo keys are already up there. The agent made no response, his eyes probing as if trying to read Vernet's mind. A drop of sweat was preparing to slide down Vernet's nose. You mind? He said, wiping his nose with his sleeve and motioning to the police car blocking his way. I'm on a tight schedule. Do all the drivers wear Rolexes? The agent asked pointing to Vernet's wrist. Vernet glanced down and saw the glistening band of his absurdly expensive watch peeking out from beneath the sleeve of his jacket. Murd. This piece of shit. Bought it for 20 euro from a Taiwanese street vendor in St. Germain des Prez. I'll sell it to you for 40. The agent paused and finally stepped aside. No thanks. Have a safe trip. Vernet did not breathe again until the truck was a good 50 meters down the street. And now he had another problem. His cargo. Where do I take them? 